Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first issue briefing of day three of the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum 2016. We're pivoting away from our subjects of yesterday. We covered the Jasmine Revolution five years on. We covered political Islam, the gender gap. We're taking a, an environmental um, slant this morning for our first one. So, important time to be thinking about it in the aftermath of important talks in Paris and, and a renewed focus this year on climate change adaptation mitigation. The subject in particular is a study that has been announced and re released this week called Rethinking Plastics and the New Plastics Economy. Now, the forum, with an eye for public relations, had a rather glaring title, More, more Plastics Than Fish in the Ocean in 2015, but of course it's a much more... 2050. 2050. But of course it's a much more complex story than that. So, without further ado, I'll keep my remarks to a minimum and we'll go straight down. I just will, however, introduce my panel first. We have Ellen MacArthur, founder of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in the United Kingdom. Dominic Warre, my colleague at the World Economic Forum, head of public-private partnership. Jean-Louis Chaussard, chief executive officer of Suez, based in France. Now, Ellen, it was two years ago, I'm going to start with you first, two years ago in our old press conference room that you announced the start of Project Mainstream. So I'm very keen to hear about what you've been doing since then and what the key findings of the New Plastics Economy report are. Well, first of all, I should go back to Mainstream. Um, we created Project Mainstream because the forum and the foundation had been doing work around the subject of a circular economy, which is fundamentally a different economic model whereby products, components and materials are kept at the highest value and utility at all times. And in order to achieve that, there are certain things that companies can do, such as changing business models, changing design. But there are also things that one company cannot solve. If you want to create a continuous flow of plastics throughout the world so those plastics can be valorised, you know, the biggest plastics producer in the world could not do that because they're not party to the whole value chain. They don't reprocess, they don't collect. There are many different territories in the world. And so we came to the New Plastics Economy report through mainstream, through the realisation that WEF has a phenomenal convening power, we had the ability through WEF and mainstream to get all of the players in the value chain together to have the dialogue and have the debate around how we can build a new plastics economy and how we can fix the systemic leakage which we have with plastics. And what are the key findings of this report? The key findings of this report are, well, there are, there's obviously the, the stats around what's leaking out of the system. Um, we discovered that when you look at plastics as a whole, which is 300 million tonnes a year, 78 million tonnes of that is plastic packaging. Of that, only 14% is recovered for recycling globally. Only 10% is recycled, and because of the constitution of the plastic and the cross-contamination, um, only 5% of the value of that plastic is actually recovered. So we lose vast amounts of plastic. You know, we landfill 40%, we incinerate 14%, uh, and if you think about plastic, Every single piece of plastic that's been made over the last, say, 70 years since we started using it at speed, um, every single piece exists unless we've incinerated it. And that means that the 32% leakage we have out of the system every year ends up in the, in the environment, it ends up in rivers, it ends up in the sea, which is how we came to the stats around the, you know, the amount of plastic in the sea. And it's, it's not just you know, big bottles and things that we're used to seeing in the images, it's, it's you know, microplastics, tiny beads of plastics you can't barely see with the human eye. So it's, it's a very complex... Uh, situation, it's a complex problem, but the, the solution to that has to be multi-stakeholder. And let's talk a little bit about, about those opportunities. We, we're, we're here as a platform for multi-stakeholder collaboration, but specifically what opportunities have you identified for, for dealing with this problem that we're mm -hmm. looking for? Well, after two years of work and bringing together 40 organisations and working with 180 mm -hmm. different people, uh, we've put together five recommendations. The first is dialogue. So bringing together the parties who can actually fix this, agreeing on a way forward, a, a dialogue on you know, which, which, which covers uh, um, design, which covers you know, what needs to be done. So dialogue is the first, bringing the right people around the table. We need a protocol, a plastic <coughs> protocol, looking at design for plastics in the future so more value can be um, recovered and fed back into the economy because we're losing between 80 and 120 billion a year of the, the plastic by value itself. Um, we also need a dialogue with policymakers, which is absolutely vital to help to stimulate some of the changes in all territories of the world. We need innovation moonshots, so you know, new plastic designs. At the moment, we design a, a piece of plastic to cover a chicken for you know, maybe a week. Um, that's the design brief. Not, we, we need something to cover the chicken, but also to fit within a system. You know, plastic's not designed to fit within a system. It's designed to do a job in some, case for, in some cases for, for an hour or two hours, if it's in the case of plastic packaging, which is a vast amount of plastic produced each year. And then finally, um, the, the fifth recommendation is one of continuing with the stats and the numbers, because we found that, that there are very few studies on the global flows of plastic that exist. In fact, we couldn't find any. 
So this report has been very important for that and continuing that is, is equally important. John Leary, let's turn to you. You're head of a multi-billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. you'll, have, you'll know firsthand how difficult it is engineering the entire business model to, to supporting a disruptive change such as the circular economy. But what does it mean to you in real terms? Well, um, first of all, you're right. I mean, uh, if we speak about uh, circular economy, we mean uh, for us, for Suez, uh, a change in business model. Just give me a very simple example. Um, as it was mentioned by Hélène before, the, our historical business was to collect and to dump the waste. But today we collect, of course, but we sort uh, and we produce uh, secondary raw materials. So the offer of secondary raw materials is growing. Of course, plastic is a large part of that. So, but uh, what I would like to say, it's, it's good uh, to imagine that we can produce secondary raw materials. It means it's fine to um, strengthen the uh, offer of secondary raw material and especially of plastic. The question mark after that is, are we going to get uh, a demand for this kind of plastic? And I think it is a crucial uh, point if we want the circular economy to really uh, work on. We know that uh, uh, recycled plastic uh, consumes far less energy than to produce uh, new plastic with virgin materials. Uh, the, the, well, in terms of energy, we are talking about uh, 80, 90 percent less uh, recycling plastic than producing new plastics. The question is when the, 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 uh, the, the, the oil is uh, at uh, 30, 30 dollars a barrel, uh, how can you make uh, this new economy uh, compatible or economically compatible uh, with the recycling, the, uh, with uh, the old one, which is uh, using uh, uh, virgin materials extracted from, 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 the, from our, our planet? And I think this is where we have to speak about externalities. How shall we give a price? to those externalities if we want the circular economy uh, to, to work properly. And in my view, uh, we could talk about the package, uh, uh, circular economy package uh, recently issued by uh, the commissions. Uh, clearly, they are talking about uh, more uh, push measure, but not enough about pull measure. And it's clearly a problem between the offer and the demand of this kind of product. This is something we have to work in, in a lot if we want uh, tomorrow to enter in what I believe it's a necessity, uh, the circular economy, because it will consume far less energy, which means it will produce uh, far less uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Second, because as it was mentioned also by Hélène, and we have some reports on that, uh, the, the leakage of plastic is a real danger. Uh, what Ellen didn't say is that uh, today we are producing worldwide uh, 300 something million, but if we continue like that, by 2050, we will produce more than 1 billion tons of plastic, of which, if we continue as we are, a vast majority, 30%, will continue to leak, in, especially in the sea, in the ocean. And this is something which, in my view, is absolutely not possible. So we speak about in Paris a lot. Uh, about uh, COP21 and about energy, uh, about uh, uh, trying to, uh, to reduce uh, the, the, the temperature gap, etc. But at the end of the day, beside that, the water issue, the ocean issues are clearly a major issue for this, uh, for this century and for this world if we want to continue to grow on, a, I should say, a reasonable uh, way of living for the whole population. Give us an idea of the scale of your ambition, the, the, the pace at which you want to adjust your business to this more sustainable model. It can't be well, done overnight. But I, 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 de I describe quite well the situation. We, we have the technology, not all, but a large part of the necessary technology is on the table. Um, we, uh, we have the financial means to invest. The question is, I am not going to invest if uh, what I am going to produce uh, do, that doesn't find any people uh, to be uh, to to be used or to so the demand side is very important. So what we are discussing with many people, including the industry, but is including also the policymakers, we want to see how they help us to manage. Uh, this uh, circular econ economy that everybody is talking about, but now we have to see really uh, starting. Because I think the real point, how do we, do we start and how do we manage to make sure that all those 
plastic production we are talking about uh, is will be really a use. Uh, let me give you just an example because it's a very interesting one. Um, all the uh, people industry using plastic and large majority of them they will ask you uh, white plastic, transparent plastic, for what? Then for coloring it. So at the end of the day of the process of recycling, I got a lot of colored plastic, blue, green, as you know, red, etc., for a demand which is only, or mainly, uh, white plastic. This is this is a gap uh, that has to be uh, that has to be uh, that has to be filled because we will not be able to produce easily uh, white plastic. It's a question of technology. It's a question of cost, etc., etc. So it's typically a question. Uh, practical questions that has to be solved if we want to enter in a circular economy for plastic. Alan, we're all now, as a, as, a, as a global population, used to recycling and supportive of recycling, but it seems that we need to go a step further as if, if from what Jean-Louis is saying. Well, I, I think, you know, the stats in the report were certainly personally quite astounding. You know, in the, in the Western world, we're used to um, you know, relatively high recycling figures, but when you look at the global stats, it's, it's incredibly low. And ten percent is incredibly low, um, which which uh, forces the question that different countries have different collection systems is number one. In many companies, uh, countries, there actually isn't a collection system, which is why virtually everything ends up uh, leaking out of the system. So the value is lost, and part of the reason the value is lost is that plastic is made in a way that it cannot be valorized easily. As Jean Louis said, you know the recycled plastic is 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 significantly um, it's w it's worth less and it's more expensive to produce than the the you know the original plastic. Um, but part of the reason for that is the additives that sit within it and the way that that plastic's made, which is why if we can change the plastic pro create a plastic protocol through the new plastics economy work that we're going to w that we're going to do, then you can perhaps change the the constitution of the plastic to enable it to be recovered to a higher value in all territories, mm -hmm. because you know, no one designs as I said the, you know the chicken packet for a for a system. And plastics are made in one country and sold in another, and they, you know, drift in ocean currents to another. They go all over the world, and there's no system within which they're designed to fit. So that system is imperative in order for that value to be valorised. Dominic, what role can the foreign players, a convener of stakeholders, to help meet these goals? Thanks, Ali, um, and um, just to congratulate my uh, two panelists here on the just the, the foresight to drive, you know, the questions and then seek answers to these systemic challenges. Um, a good way of looking at it in terms of you know, um, what the forum can do, but more importantly, what is going on. Um, I like to think of 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. So um, we have a very profligate economy. Um, the IEA, the International Energy Association, um, told us that um, back in 2010, um, we will need 40% more installed energy capacity by 2030 than 2010. We're on our way to be building that. That's an enormous growth in energy. And most of that, at that time, was seen to be fossil-based energy. Two, food. We've talked a little bit about chicken and packaging. 40% or thereabouts, according to the FAO and other experts in the space, 40% of all food produced is wasted. 40%. Um, whether at the kind of uh, growth, transportation, but a lot is wasted in the household um, and at the end of the line. 40%. Three. Um, by 2030, it's estimated that there'll be a gap between the water that we will need to power our economy, to fuel our economy um, under business as usual measures. There'll be a gap of 40% between what is safely available and what we're going to need. 40, 40, 40, food, energy, water. These are systemic problems, which if we just don't address them, we'll get to a stage where we'll have crisis and crunch point and crisis and crunch point. We can see that starting to happen in the water space. You can see that in terms of how difficult it is to continue to increase production of food without looking at kind of waste in the supply chain. The systemic problems, as Ellen um, was remarking, require multiple people along a value chain to come together and say, you know, what is it that I'm doing in this bit? What is it that I think we need um, from this person and that person to absolutely change the system? The plastics issue here is a really good example of when you kind of, something you take for granted, you, you just get into the, into the issue and you realize how almost ridiculous the situation is, how ridiculous it is that there might be demand for blue, red, green plastic when you, sir, um, can see the kind of broad problem that you have to deal with and the potential economic benefits of fixing this. You, 
um, and the analysis that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation have undertaken can completely see how ridiculous it is that so much of this plastic is just wasted. It literally is dumped, it's leaked, is a, is a technical phrase. We don't really think about that, we just think, oh, it's plastic. The fact that plastic doesn't go away, that the only way it can go away is to be incinerated, and it already, as a legacy, we have 150 million tonnes of plastic in the ocean, and the biologists and the best brains on fish reckon there's about 760, 765 million tonnes of fish. You know, that's not good. But there's no one person in the value chain who can change that. So the platforms and experience and appetite for the forum to take on some of these global challenges and bring together people along a value chain, not necessarily just um, campaigning NGOs, although they are important, but people from the world of finance who kind of put their money into companies um, like Suez, people from the world of analytics who can get under the skin of the statistics, people from the actuaries who have the accounting systems, people from the project developers, from the cutting edge technologies, all of these people to try and fix the problem. That's kind of the role that the forum can play. You'll notice it doesn't say World Plastics Forum or World <laughs> Fish Forum or World Global Problems Forum. And that's because economics, I would posit, is at the heart of all of these issues. If we can get economic incentive right, if we can get the price corrections correct, if we can encourage policy makers, decision makers, business leaders and others to get that economic incentive correct, we can solve these problems. But it does take a lot of work. It seems like a suitable juncture to see if there are any questions. OK, so if you wouldn't mind just waiting for a microphone so that our audience online can hear. Um, I come from the French financial services industry and have seen significant change occurring there um, over the last 10 years. One way um, how change has occurred is by naming and shaming um, and by putting a lot of pressure um, on um, all parts in that also relatively complex industry um, to change um, partly the regulatory um, bodies, global ones, um, have contributed by changing the regulatory scheme by issuing huge fines. Um, but um, I saw that that was actually quite effective. Um, so a question I would have is, um, as you're trying to address um, uh, these very complex sort of issues with long value chains, a lot of different players involved, partly private, partly um, public, um, is this sort of naming and shaming, ranking different companies on how well they're doing um, uh, ranking different countries, frankly, on how well they're doing and implementing stuff. Is that part of the thought process? And if so, um, how far um, evolved is it? A very valid question. And as an as a organization in the forum, we, we, we measure and rank countries in terms of their ability to address issues such as inclusive growth and gender and uh, long-term economic competitiveness. Ellen, are we missing a trick by, by, by not taking this direct and uh, frankly quite effective approach? I think, I, I think it's a very interesting question and there's no, there's no question that regulation is an important part of this. I think this is a high volume, low value material which goes all over the world. Um, so the, you know, one of the five recommendations of the report is to have an engagement with policymakers and work out how we can best achieve this. But I'd like to come back to Dominic's point on economics. Um, the foundation has been working for five and a half years on the idea of a circular economy. And when we brought the idea to the forum for the first time in January 12 to 2012, the first thing we did was we produced an economic report with analysis by McKinsey to look into the economic opportunity of this model. And we're talking here about a high, val sorry, high volume, low value material. The circular economy is all materials. It's all products, components, it's buildings, it's everything being kept at their highest value and utility at all times. Um, but it's very much driven by economics. Um, so there are regulations that will help this to happen. That first report, though it wasn't an FMCG report, that first report showed that there was a 630 billion <coughs> US dollar economic opportunity to be had, and the first 350 could be achieved without any regulation whatsoever. This one's harder. It's you know, part of FMCG, 3.2 trillion market. 
Um, and we currently only re recover 18% of that. That's not just plastics, that's you know, all FMCG. Um, but there's a massive economic opportunity to recover the other over 80% of FMCG. It's 3.2 trillion. We lose vast uh, volumes and value of materials every single year. So we've taken plastics because it's economically it is a harder one. There are more things that have to change to realise that value, as Jean-Louis said. It's a colour of plastic, it's the demand, it's the quality of the plastic, and it needs all those actors in the value chain. You can become circular as a business in some ways on your own, but this one you can't. This one is a, it's a, it's a systemic challenge, and as Dominic said, it needs a systemic approach. It needs everyone to come together to realise it. So I think there's a push and a pull, but we have to create the pull also. Let's take one more question from the gentleman in the front row, and then we'll go to you, sir. Maybe because we're running out of time, we'll cover both questions. Could you just... Pass the microphone off to yours, and we'll get it over to the man in the back. So I have something totally different. I do with Seth Berkeley. I do vaccines in developing countries, but I'm a passionate sailor. And you've talked about fixing this problem going forward and you know, making solutions for it. What about the stuff that's in the ocean now, and what can be done about that? Okay, yeah, so assuming to, that you could. What to do mm -hmm. now, and let's see what this gentleman. Um, hi. Uh, congrats for the panel. Uh, as we're talking about plastics, but there are several types of plastics, and you cannot definitely pu put all of them together. And I'm remembering a Nature magazine uh, a document that, that was talking about the alternative of mentioning at least four of the seven types of plastic as hazardous uh, waste material. How do you see that possible? I've heard people saying that maybe some types of plastic may be considered as uh, tobacco. Uh, that type mm -hmm. of industry, mm -hmm. how do you feel like so that? So quick, quick mm -hmm. fixes and, and labelling. And John Louis, do you want to talk about the plastics? Because you're, you work, you work I mean, I'm happy to, but... I am, I am not sure we can say uh, the, the plastic uh, is like to tobacco, no. Uh, I think today uh, it's, it has been uh, probably true in the past where some plastic have some leakage, especially in, the, in, uh, in, water, in, in bottle, plastic bottles. But uh, frankly speaking, today, uh, I do not believe that uh, drinking water from a, from a plastic bottle is the most dangerous uh, thing that you can do in your daily life. So, no, I do, I do not see the danger of plastic like that. I see the danger in what we have been uh, saying before and uh, to the question of the oce oceans. I just would like to, before giving the, 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 the floor to, to Hélène, I will, I will just give you a, a, a figure. We produce in the developed countries 200,000 microfibers per person and per day, of which 90 to 95% is stopped by the waste treatment plant that we, we, ha we have here in Europe, which means that roughly 10% still go to the river, which means it still go to the ocean. So if we do not stop the use of plastic I should say, at the true beginning, which means uh, using less, recycling more, I mean, the, 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 the problem of plastic in the oceans will continue to be one of the, in my view, most uh, dangerous and difficult uh, problems to be solved in the future. Uh, I'll pick up on the, the um, quick, fixes. quick fixes oceans. Um, there are lots of organisations working on cleaning up the oceans, and they're <coughs> doing phenomenal work. That's not where we sit. What we're trying to do is go to the beginning of the chain and work out how we stop it going there. But is it possible I mean, to get it out now? There are people who are out there with ships taking samples, working out how they can valorise what's there, but there's a problem because what's there is mixed uh, product, it's got additives in, and it actually is incredibly expensive to remove. So there are challenges there, but there's more going in every year, and that's going faster and faster. Our role here is to go to the beginning of the chain and try and work out how we can stop that happening in the future. Okay. I'd like to pick up on the um, regulation piece, sure. if I may, because it's, it's a very important one, because you have this conundrum about big government, no government, market signals, and how does all that fit together? Analogue, um, supply chains is another area. Half of the world's tropical deforestation is driven by just the, un the unsustainable sourcing of four commodities, beef, soy, paper and pulp, and palm oil. So if you have sustainable sourcing in those four commodity chains, half the world's tropical deforestation is resolved, according to the forestry specialists, it's about 8-9% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the big breakthrough there has not been um, legislation, has been information. Um, there's a fascinate, fascinating piece of technology called Global Forest Watch, which from satellite data can show you exactly who's burning what in terms of unsustainable forest resourcing, whether it's a plantation owner or a government or smallholder. And the explosion of change as a result of information technology, you can see what's going on has changed the mindset completely. It's like a disinfectant. 
Um, in this domain area, you can imagine the same sort of technology to see where the plastic is leaking from, which countries, which bays, and I can guarantee that that would change the game quite considerably. Let's just take one very quick question. We are running over. Uh, I was scandalous. just wondering, isn't the fact that it's a high volume, low value material also the big problem? That because it doesn't really carry its own costs, it should be, if you consider the externalities mm -hmm. that we deal now, mm -hmm. it should cost something else. There should be another cost to it. Well, that's one of the things that we raised within the yeah. report. In the externalities of plastic packaging yeah. are 40 billion, and that exceeds the profit pool of the plastic packaging um, economy. So there are some big questions. You know, many of that isn't being, much of that isn't being paid, but actually some of it really is. I've had conversations here. For example, the city of J Jakarta spends mass vast amounts of money unblocking its sewerage system uh, because it's it's clogged with plastic. So you know there are externalities that really are being paid, not not by the plastic producers or the manufacturers, mm -hmm. but actually just by a by the, the the regions because the system is fundamentally broken and it's fixing this. It's, it, it, well, it's because we have something that has no collection system and cannot be valorised. There's, that some, there's something that it's about 300 um, a million uh, uh, euros a year that Europe is spending cleaning up its beaches because of the plastics that are arriving. So the, the point is very well made. Mm. Um, but then the flip side of it is true as well. Is that, so who carries the cost? And is it mm. then a technical kind of solution which is sort of being explored here about you know, how, do you, how do you make um, the system work so that actually this never gets to that point and it's continually kind of... Um, looped around versus um, a kind of burden of cost mm -hmm. on somebody. So it's a very interesting uh, conundrum. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. just an economic price signal. And, and quick, I, quick, I quick think, addition. I think it, to also answer that, the speed of increase of plastic use is incredible, to Jean Louis's point. You know, when I was looking at the graph that we put in the report on the stats, you know, when my dad was born, he's just over 70, we, we didn't have plastic packaging really, um, or plastics. By the time I was born, it was 40 million tonnes, and now it's 300 million tonnes. That's in less than 40 years. I mean, that's just the speed of increase is, is staggering. So, it's, you know, they, those costs will, will increase, those problems will get worse unless we, we in, we're able to fix the system, which means the plastic must be valorised, which means we need to look at an approach whereby we can pick materials that can be uh, recovered and cycled to their highest level. Now, we're running over time, but we do things slightly differently here in the issue briefing, so I'm going to persevere. I just want to develop um, Seth's question, about, not about quick fixes, but about easy wins. What we're talking about is very, very difficult long-term challenges, but what can we realistically expect to see in the next 12 months in terms of progress? Jean-Louis, perhaps, you could start with that question. 12 months is short. Mm. I mean, yeah. we are talking about uh, 300 million uh, plastic. You... If I, if I, if you look around you, I'm sure that you have a plastic uh, uh, piece of something with you. Uh, I think this is a piece of plastic. Uh, this is a piece of plastic. Uh, it means, uh, and you can see that there are all of them different kind of plastic. This kind of plastic is not the same as this one. It's not the same color. It's not the same quality. Uh, if we want to um, to change, we are, we we need. Um, in my view, the, the first real point I, I, is to, to, to put together policymakers, industry, uh, customers, uh, in order to really um, find solutions with, which are at the same time rational and possible. Um, if we want to go too fast, uh, I think it will be very difficult because you will have some blockage in the, in, in the society. Uh, and when, for example, we speak about externalities, uh, I frankly believe and that one of the major issues for us is certainly to put a price to carbon, one way or another. Uh, but don't forget that at the end of the day, uh, it is a customer which is going to pay the price of the externalities. So uh, this is a complex issue, but we have to start. We have to discuss with policymakers. We have to discuss with, with uh, large producers. We have to discuss with customers. And one of the interests of, of the forum and of the discussion we have uh, in mainstream is the fact that we try to bring together all those uh, players in order to find reasonable solutions. Now, yes, we need to go fast, we have to change. And in my view, especially in Europe, the, uh, the Commission, with this new uh, uh, circular economy package, has a clear and very important role to play. Push measure, yes, but pull measure are also necessary. Offer, demand. Um, I think in 12 months, quite a lot can be done. Um, we're at a stage now of awareness. Before you perhaps came to Davos, you hadn't heard of something called the new plastics economy. 
Um, I guarantee you, um, this time in 12 months, there'll be a lot of people realizing that we have a problem with plastics. Um, the first step um, uh, for an alcoholic is to realize they've got a problem. Um, for the system, it's got to realize it's got a problem before you can start to tackle the solution. Um, people now talk about water, water for energy, water for food. Eight years ago, we didn't really think like that. So you can start to adjust the debate. Once you get the realization of a problem, then this report contains the fixes. First step, 12 months from now, this will be embedded in the kind of psyche that plastics is not a benign thing, that we do have um, a problem in our system. I would pick up on Jean-Louis' point that a year is, is not a long time, but if I reflect back on the last 12 months of putting the report together, um, and the fact that in order to solve the problem, you have to realize you have one, people are not running away from this issue. You know, we're working with, the, with, with, with scientists, of course, but we're also working with retailers, with producers, with huge producers of plastic globally. They're absolutely not running away from this. Then everybody knows there's a problem. There really is a problem. This is about trying to put people together to try and find solutions. You know, there are five recommendations. They're not going to happen overnight, but we, we have to look at this systemically. I would say that what's been fantastic over the last 12 months is the, the stakeholders who are already engaged are fully looking at this systemically and working out how we can fix this in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, in a big way. Well, we'd love to hold you to account and bring you back next year to see how things Fantastic. Are going. Do it. Do it. <laughs> all right, that's it. It's scheduled. The first session opened up for AM17. Thank you all very much. This issue briefing is now closed. Thank you.